What do the changes this week mean for Embracer, Eidos, and Crystal Dynamics? Well, more than people are saying. Huge news for the future in more ways than one. Let's break this down and not just regurgitate some stuff, but look at what actually is happening. The massive news this week has to do with Embracer Group, the investment pack led by Lars Wingfor and now owns more IPs than most other companies combined. I'm going to break down why the news that was announced this week could mean something incredibly large for all the companies that are within that super pack. First, Eidos Montreal, they announced that they had obtained ownership of all the previous intellectual properties that they had worked on, which includes titles like Deus Ex and Thief. This is very significant news since it means that those intellectual properties are once again being actually controlled by the studios that developed them. I don't know, it just seems to me that if a painter paints, he should own his painting. Although a great deal of the people who worked on such games has moved on, the developers nonetheless retain that cultural essence and personality of their products, as well as the people who worked on them before, passing it down even in just conversations. Seeing the intellectual properties returning to those companies is some of the best news this year. And it's connected to that big purchase where Embracer Group bought out those firms for a total of $300 million, therefore bringing both businesses under that ownership, but also letting them have freedom in the games that they want to develop. And he's been very adamant about. Something that's vital to remember is that Lars isn't a great fan of AAA games in the current environment that we have them. His idea of AAA might be slightly different than, say, a Microsoft or a Sony. His latest response to all of these actions was a statement to the effect of, if we set reasonable expectations, I think we will also be delighted with the financial success of all this. Be reminded of that language because it's a big deal and it's spoken by somebody who is an investor. He's the kind of person who gathers firms because he believes other people will find value in them to invest. Collecting companies is one thing that the Embracer Group has done very well in the past, but it's their incredible number of IPs that are separate even from these two companies. What if some of these companies start working on all these other IPs? We could be seeing games and titles in worlds we haven't seen for years. However, Thief, Deus Ex, put me down for at least one of each. My sources have been pretty quiet, apparently, when it comes to Eidos and the hard work on a new game that they have. It's in addition to doing any preliminary work on several other projects, but I've been informed that it is not a Deus Ex game. It's not a game that we probably expect. It's a brand new IP, which I think is less significant in nature than some of these major names, but it makes a lot of sense, especially because some of this was in flux. However, things get much better in the future because we also see Crystal Dynamics they also made an announcement around the same topic, reclaiming intellectual property from Square Enix, which included Tomb Raider and Legacy of Kane video game franchises. But just think about this. Legacy of Kane is a very fascinating topic just by itself. Imagine the possibilities if they had the power of today's technology at their disposal here for a new one. Despite the fact that Square Enix once controlled these IPs, Tomb Raider has been quite successful all by itself, despite... A couple issues with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. They didn't smash it into the earth like some kind of money-fueled failure meteor, which is probably what I expected from them. Tomb Raider in particular is also a well-known intellectual property that hasn't really declined all that much in quality, making it a really valuable investment for the future that has potential to support the legacy of Kane and the success of other IPs as Success a lot of times allows for people to make bigger choices and bigger changes. While Shadow didn't do as well as, say, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Rise has an impressive 88% score on Open Critic, so we certainly know they're going to move on there. But back to Legacy of Cain for a second. I wanted to give you all that data about Tomb Raider so that we could talk about Legacy of Cain because it's a separate thing. With the success that we see, at least, of Steel Rising and the unique way in which they've handled that format, we can witness games that are now firmly established in a particular set of genres that's switching things up, which is situated between games in the manner of Dark Souls and also third-person action games, like, let's say, A Devil May Cry, as well as more daring titles like Darksiders. Imagine that somewhere in the middle, we get some new games in the Legacy of Kane series that aims to make use of today's technology in order to offer a proper sequel, or maybe a reinvention or reboot of the world and how it's handling everything. This is fantastic news for everybody concerned, since it puts these large titles, these enormous blockbuster series, cherished masterpieces, squarely in the finest spot that they could probably be in at this particular time. Imagine that Thief and Legacy of Kane were both published in the same year, a new one for each, or a reimagined version of Tomb Raider or Deus Ex. Getting all of these titles, including all of the other ones that Embracer works on, is just incredible. Now imagine something even cooler, though. 
Crystal Dynamics and Eidos have some open development teams, ones that aren't currently mired in a ton of game development right now. Embracer Group's massive IP list, you should see this thing, stretches from Lord of the Rings to Neverwinter to Hob, Metro, and The Ascent. Laris is teams upon teams that can create titles in all these variety of IPs. And while this year has seen delays after delays, and those won't stop anytime soon, the idea that teams once constrained to particular games, especially under their old publisher, or working hard on titles that the publisher said didn't do good, well, like Guardians of the Galaxy, could be working on a ton of IPs that have a massive vested already there fan interest. Future's bright, or it could be like as dark as Deus Ex, we'll just have to see. Welcome to the news bit section of this, where I blurb out some small bits of news as well. Stalker 2 devs have clarified why Xbox was doing delivery refunds on the title, since it seems like it was coming out and not delayed any more than the initial a first official announcement of a delay. The company said the following when WCC F Tech asked them about this. We had to postpone the release date after the war started. We announced it in 2023 during Microsoft's extended E3 show. Microsoft refunds the pre-orders for games with no exact release date. That is proper procedure. The game will be available for pre-order on Xbox as soon as we announce the exact release date. December 23 is an analog of placeholder until we're ready to share the new release date publicly. Stalker 2 releases sometime in 2023 as for now. Now, they ask for now, that's a little bit bothersome. You can notice this a lot of times in some of these announcements where they're hedging their bets a little bit. But my guess is Stalker 3 is actually heading on its way. And the idea that they go out there and talk about the proper procedure for how Xbox works and their ideals behind being as clear as they possibly can be while still being involved in the flexibility of development. And the idea of not exactly announcing a release date is fine with me. It makes more sense, and it really relieves the stress on everybody involved until they finally get an idea of what they're doing. The next bit of data is both good and bad. CDPR has informed gamers that the DLC coming for the game seems to be the only one planned. While sad, it also, I think, appears for the best. They've stated they will be rewriting the police system in a patch as well. So if you've had issues with that police system, which it would seem almost impossible not to, we're going to get some fixes for that. More importantly, they announced Red Mod. Now, Red Mod is a mod manager that works seamlessly with Nexus mods and is going to actually integrate into any past mod communities. The exciting element here, though, is it also supports more in game engine changes and elements, makes it easier for mod creators to add things like custom sounds, animations, scripts, and more. And those are some of the fixes, as we've seen with Bethesda titles and the unofficial patches, that a lot of times the developers and publishers just don't seem to work in to any of of their further work. It's interesting here also that it adds full documentation to the mod process and the manager itself. They also added a Blender software plugin for this. So there's gonna be a ton of support. However, I think this all makes sense. Mod communities have kept both good and bad games alive for years, just go and check. So the idea that perhaps they wanna let the game sit and percolate and look at what mod creators are going to get further ideas from, how they're gonna create mods for games that come out after cyberpunk and sort of let cdpr look at this and decide what they want to create later it should be tempered with the idea though that witcher is their next game and they expect it to be a series so unless someone else steps in you could be looking at more than five years for a sequel even if they're looking to have pre-development teams come in here and start creating even in the next year it is going to be pushed out a ways i think this makes sense CDPR really wanted to create a good game, I think, and it just fell to the wayside and had so many issues. Even if you like it, we can all agree that it really did not end up doing what they were hoping. It did sell a ton. In fact, it's one of the number one selling titles, but the psychology around it is fairly negative. And you find that people who like it have to defend themselves and people who don't like it really don't want to talk about it anymore. They're a little bit burned out. Now I'm still crossing my fingers for a Shadowrun IP. Somebody to take the Shadowrun games and say, listen, let's do a first person shooter and nail it where CDPR didn't. We're also looking at possibility in the future of a Deus Ex game, which I've always felt handles transhumanism as well as just the cyberpunk ethos better than Actually, Cyberpunk 2077 did. I want to know what you guys think about this. Are you excited for any of this? What do you think is going to happen? No one knows for sure. These are the kind of things that are up in the air. If you want to continue to check out the channel, subscribe because we're going to have stuff for the new Assassin's Creed announcements. We're going to have some surprise guests on some of the podcasts as well as new previews and reviews from me. Stay tuned to the channel. Peace out. I hope you have an amazing week.